In Leto, we are presented with a charismatic and heroic father figure, ultimately destroyed by the machinations of treachery and political intrigue. With Paul Atreides, we find a more conventional hero, at least when we first meet him. Paul's birth itself is a result of the devotion of his mother Jessica to Duke Leto. Leto's desire is to have a son in order to continue on as leader of House Atreides. However, Jessica, as a Bene Gesserit, has been ordered only to produce daughters to House Atreides as part of their breeding program. The Emperor himself, who also has a desire for a son, has also only produced daughters as a result of this program. The Bene Gesserit's intent is to breed an Atreides female to a Harkonnen male, in order to create the Kwisatz Haderach, a male superbeing with the powers of the female Bene Gesserit. Because of her love for Leto, Jessica disobeys her orders and produces Paul, who goes on to become a Kwisatz Haderach, albeit one generation earlier than the Bene Gesserit had intended. We first meet Paul at the beginning of the novel, when he is observed by the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohiam. Aware of being observed as he sleeps, Paul dreams of Arrakis before awakening and practicing mind-body awareness exercises prior to being tested by the Reverend Mother. The test that she puts him under is the Gom Jabbar. Reverend Mother Mohiam holds a Gom Jabbar at his neck, essentially a poison needle which kills only animals, while forcing him to put his hand inside a black box. If Paul takes his hand out of the box, he dies. If he does not, he survives. The box induces pain to an extreme degree, and Paul is able to overcome this by his training and his mental awareness. The old woman said, You've heard of animals chewing off a leg to escape a trap? There's an animal kind of trick. A human would remain in the trap endure the pain, feigning death that he might kill the trapper and remove a threat to his kind. The itch became the faintest burning. Why are you doing this? he demanded. To determine if you are human, be silent. Paul passes the test and lives to see that no real harm has been done at all. The test as we go on to discover has to do with the Great Convention. The Reverend Mother explains, that the test is to set him free, and quotes the Orange Catholic Bible to him in relation to not making a machine akin to a human mind. This opening section of the novel not only serves to introduce us to Paul, but also to immediately immerse us subtly in the political and religious spheres of the Dune universe. While being taught this lesson, Paul not only demonstrates his unusual talents, but also his higher cognitive abilities, as is illustrated when he is able to determine the true function of the Bene Gesserit schools, which happens to be political rather than the religious aspect they like to promote. In addition, we understand that Paul is able to detect the truth, and the Reverend Mother adds to our sense of mystique about Paul when we learn that he may be the Kwisatz Haderach, the one who can be many places at once. In setting out to question and explore these periodic messianic convulsions and our role in them, Herbert at the beginning of June immediately starts to impact upon our sense of wonder about Paul Atreides, and makes us question how special a character he really is. In exploring the role of people in these periodic messianic compulsions, Herbert subtly makes the reader themselves experience this directly throughout the novel. Frank Herbert makes sure our sympathy is continually directed towards Paul and House Atreides by our own false sense of prescience throughout the Dune novels. This is created by the various future histories, commentaries and hagiographies that precede each chapter throughout all the Dune novels. In a sense, we share the malaise of Paul's prescience, in that we are both able to determine a little of what lies ahead and are simultaneously powerless to alter the future of the events in the story, forewarned as we are with these fragments gleaned from the rich literary tapestry that Herbert weaves. Hence we know for example from the works called The Dictionary of Moadib and Moadib Family Commentaries 
by the Princess Irulan that the Sukh Dr. Yui will eventually betray the Atreides to the Harkonnens before the event occurs in the narrative. Paul, as we discover early on, is also a mentat, possessing yet another talent that makes us sense the superhuman qualities in this youth and the potential he has as a leader. As his father puts it, a mentat duke would be formidable indeed. The mentat is essentially a person trained as a human computer, able to process vast amounts of data, and are prized by the great houses, as thinking computers and machines are strictly forbidden by the great convention. As Paul moves with his family to Arrakis, our sense of foreboding regarding the Atreides increases, and along with this, Paul's prescient dreams start to take on a greater intensity, as he is now surrounded by the drug melange that exists in the food, water, and even the air he breathes on the desert planet. The sense that Paul might be the one the Fremen call the Mahdi, the Lisan al Gaib, continues through the rumours and whisperings of the people of Arakin and the Duke's new staff in the palace. As our foreboding increases, our sense of mystique and the superhuman about Paul and his mother Jessica continues to grow. Paul and Jessica have unusual encounters with the Duke's new housekeeper, the Shadot Mapes. The Shadot Mapes tests Jessica according to the Fremen's legends about the Lisan al Gaib, who will be brought to Arrakis by his mother, a reverend mother of the Bene Gesserit. The sense of prophecy being fulfilled is obvious to Mapes when she presents the gift of a Chris knife, a blade made from a tooth of the worms of Arrakis. Jessica is able to answer her probing questions and increase the sense of mystery around both her and her son. It is through the Missionaria Protectiva that Jessica is able to do this, understanding the religious, cultural and linguistic concepts that are shored up in the meaning of the knife's purpose. She immediately realises that the order she belongs to, the Bene Gesserit, has planted these myths in the distant past as part of a long term survival strategy. The Missionaria Protectiva is essentially a propaganda tool that allows any stranded member of the Sisterhood to manipulate a local population based on their religion, myths and legends. The seeds of these religious concepts are sown long in the past of these cultures, and when a Bene Gesserit is in need, she may use these myths and appear as if fulfilling prophecy, often guaranteeing them a position of safety, reverence and power. Numerous myths and religious tropes are planted on different worlds, depending on the circumstances there. On realising that this particular myth has been planted on Arrakis, it is enough to tell Jessica a little about this world. Jessica hesitated. The thing must take its course. That was a specific catchphrase from the Missionaria Protectiva's stock of incantations, the coming of the Reverend Mother to free you. But I'm not a Reverend Mother, Jessica thought, and then, Great Mother, they planted that one here. This must be a hideous place. The Missionaria Protectiva is Herbert's own way of presenting a monomythic structure to the Dune universe, and illustrates the ability of the Bene Gesserit to easily manipulate entire populations and their leaders. To a certain degree, the Missionaria Protectiva requires a messianic character to be able to carry forth the concept of subverting religious beliefs for one's own survival or political necessity. The Fremen have easily been captivated by Liet Kynes' idea of changing their planet's ecology, and it takes very little for them to see in Paul and Jessica their messiah and his holy mother. The tension in the narrative increases as we approach the inevitable fall of House Atreides, and Paul is tested yet again this time by an assassination attempt. His heroic accoutrements are added to again in the eyes of the reader, as he saves the life of Mapes, unnecessarily putting his own at risk at the same time. His reward is to become armed with the same knowledge we, as readers, already possess, that there is a traitor among his father's household. Paul's continual testing and trials represent not only a journey towards manhood, but also part of his journey towards apotheosis. 
The Gom Jabbar at the beginning of Dune tests his perception and observation, as well as his ability to deal with crisis. In addition, the teachers his father has provided for him test his combat abilities, though in more an academic fashion. The assassination attempt on Paul represents his first transition to manhood through an ordeal of violence, and at the same time, one of the trials an archetypal hero must face. The Fremen's attitude to Paul is further revealed to us in this chapter which illustrates greatly the various systems on Arrakis which I will discuss at greater length later. But it is his introduction to one such system, that of the Stillsuit, that again helps enforce our, and the Fremen's, sense of mysticism about this young man. The Stillsuit is a filter and heat exchange system which allows its wearer to preserve almost all of the body's moisture in the desert, a tool essential for survival on Arrakis. When meeting Liat Kynes for the first time, the planetary ecologist advises the Duke and his party on how to wear and breathe in such a suit for maximum efficiency. Paul, however, has already worked out how to do this, and has donned his still suit desert fashion. This prompts Kynes to speculate on whether Paul is indeed the Messiah spoken of in Fremen legends. And Kynes rubbed his cheek, thinking of the legend, he shall know your ways as though born to them. Paul's talents of observation and truth sense also impress Kynes when he is able to identify correctly two Fremen fleeing from a spice harvester. Again Kynes applies what he sees to the prophecies of the Lisan al Gaib, remembering that he shall see through all subterfuge. Kynes reserves judgment on the Atreides, initially indicating a point of view that they are no better than the Harkonnen. His attitudes to the Duke and his family do change by the actions of the Atreides, and the potential manifestation of the fulfilment of prophecy by Paul. It is a relationship that helps ultimately to save the lives of Paul and his mother. After the inevitable fall of House Atreides, Paul and his mother are able to escape into the desert, though the attrition to House Atreides is enormous with the Duke, Yui and Duncan Idaho all killed during or after the Harkonnen attack. It is while spending their first night in the desert that Paul's transformation finally begins, as he and his mother hide in a still tent. It is at this point that Paul experiences a rebirth into a new consciousness. When he emerges from the tent, we realise he is a Kwisat Sadrach, a male Bene Gesserit with superhuman abilities. He is more than just a Mentat Duke, and something else altogether. He is able to determine that his mother is pregnant with his sister, and another revelation becomes apparent to his sight. His mother is the daughter of the Baron Harkonnen. The dreams that Paul had experienced have now become a fully developed prescient ability, and we start to realise as Paul does, that he has some terrible purpose. Upon discovering that the spice is in everything on Arrakis, even in the air, his awareness increases to the point where he is able to see the various paths laid out ahead of him, the possible futures, and his role in them. These possible futures finally reveal to Paul the intent of the Bene Gesserit's breeding program, to renew the human race by war, a long term approach to evolution by social Darwinism and artificial selection to help create new and stronger genetic bloodlines in the human race. He had seen a warrior religion there, a fire spreading across the universe with the Atreides green and black banner waving at the head of fanatic legions drunk on spice liquor. Gurney Halleck and a few others of his father's men, a pitiful few, were among them, all marked by the hawk symbol from the shrine of his father's skull. I can't go that way, he muttered. That's what the old witches of your schools really want. I don't understand you, Paul, his mother said. He remained silent, thinking like the seed he was, thinking with the race consciousness he had first experienced as terrible purpose. He found that he no longer could hate the Bene Gesserit or the Emperor or even the Harkonnens. 
They were all caught up in the need of their race to renew its scattered inheritance, to cross and mingle and infuse their bloodlines in a great new pulling of genes. And the race knew only one sure way for this, the ancient way, the tried and certain way that ruled over everything in its path. Jihad. It is upon his emergence from the tent that Paul is really Moadib, his prescience knowing that this is what the Fremen will call him. At this point in June, we begin the second part of the novel, and we witness both Paul and his mother's transformation into Fremen, and the rise of Paul in their ranks, not just as a leader, but as a prophet and messiah. Simultaneously, as Paul's psychological transformation begins to move towards his role as messiah and hero, he also suffers what is essentially a minor death to his personality, losing some of his humanity. This is in part due to the increased heightening of both his mentat powers and his awareness, looking at events from a cold dispassionate point of view, even to the point where he is initially unable to mourn for his dead father. As Paul and his mother join the ranks of the Fremen, he is once again forced to go through a series of life-threatening tests. This is part of the road of trials in Campbell's second stage of the heroic journey in the monomyth, namely the initiation. Almost immediately, Paul is forced into a Tahadi challenge, essentially single combat to the death with a young Fremen called Jamis. Paul is victorious although Jamis is the first person he has ever killed, and he begins to be immersed in Fremen culture and tradition from this point. Victory means he claims Jamis's water, as well as the responsibility for his wife Hara and her children. It is in the ceremony for the recently deceased Jamis that Paul again impacts his mystique upon the Fremen by shedding tears for the dead man on a world where every single drop of water is preserved by necessity. These tears are seen as a great honour by the Fremen and a gift from him to the shadow world. This also reinforces Miller's idea of the hero as an intermediary and the sense that this should be something to fear. The first time Paul is viewed in this way, it is immediately after his first killing of a man, one of the Fremen's own tribe members. As Paul is accepted by the Fremen with a sense of awe, his mother Jessica, who has already been accepted as a Syadina or Holy Acolyte, must also pass a deadly test in order to become the tribe's new Reverend Mother. The test involves taking the bile from a drowned maker, the larval stage of the sandworms of Arrakis, and transforming the poisonous bile into a safe drug that is to be used in an orgiastic ritual by the tribe. Jessica is forced to focus on a psychokinesthetic extension of herself and look within her body to alter the chemical structure of the bile until it is safe. As the poisonous bile is transformed by Jessica, she changes into a Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother. Once this has occurred, the old Reverend Mother Ramalo passes on her memories to Jessica, only to realise with horror that Jessica is pregnant with Paul's sister, Alia. Alia will be born with all the knowledge of a fully grown Reverend Mother, and in many ways will be as unusual and powerful as her brother. The Fremen consume the transformed drug and use it in an orgiastic ritual, in many ways similar to the use of psychotropic drugs in early religions and mysteries. Paul is able to sense that the drug is in some way a poison and only consumes it once his mother informs him that it is safe. The drug opens his awareness and inflates again his prescient ability. From this time on Paul's focus on the future and the possibilities open to him are fully realised, though the probabilities contained therein occasionally hide some things from him. At this stage therefore, Paul is still able to be surprised by what occurs in the world not being fully prescient. His focus however is increasingly orientated towards death, whether it be the death of the billions who will die in the jihad to come, carried out in his name, or the myriad of possible deaths he is able to see for himself, 
if he does not divert from his path. His development into a hero is key at this point, as his realisation that even association of his death will leave a great impact upon the universe. Paul has already realised that his mother through his unborn sister would create another religious figure in the Bene Gesserit mould for the Fremen to focus their energies upon. In doing this, through his prescience, Paul sees that she has ensured that even if he does die, the Jihad will go on, only with Alia at its centre. As Paul continues to grow and develop into a guerrilla leader and a religious icon to the Fremen, the tests he undergoes become more and more hazardous. As we follow him on his journey, our sense of the narrative in Dune becomes increasingly focused towards its epic nature, with Paul as our epic hero. It will only be later with both Dune Messiah and Children of Dune that this focus will shift. With Herbert's deliberate intention of undermining the hero that we follow throughout the narrative, who we are increasingly in awe of, just as the Fremen are. It will only be as we progress through the first Dune trilogy that we will realise that Paul's status as hero will shift fundamentally away from the traditional epic hero towards the tragic hero. Paul's status as a religious icon, prophet and messiah becomes increasingly cemented in Fremen culture as we move through book 3 of Dune. It becomes increasingly difficult to tell past from present and present from future. In the two years that have passed from the events in Book 2, the third part of Dune, named The Prophet, shows us the different ways that Paul and Alia are accepted by the Fremen. Whereas Paul faces a number of challenges in single combat, many of which are handled by his lover Chani, Alia's unusual abilities made manifest in the female other memory of the Bene Gesserit begin to greatly disturb the Fremen. Paul has two final heroic tests before him, prior to his attainment of apotheosis. The first of these is to ride one of the great worms of the desert, revered by the Fremen as both Shai Halud and Shaitan. Again, this test viewed through Paul's prescience focuses on death. If he succeeds, events will progress and he feels he may still be able to stop the jihad that has to come. If he dies, he is able to see that the jihad will continue regardless. The only thing that is certain is that either way, the Fremen will view what happens as a legend whether he succeeds or fails. At the same time, many of the younger Fremen feel that if Paul succeeds in riding the worm, then he must challenge Stilgar in a traditional duel to the death over the Fremen's leadership, something Paul does not wish to do and avoid if possible. Paul succeeds in riding the worm, which again represents another process of rebirth for the hero, though this time it is more of a cultural rebirth as well as an affirmation of his manhood. It is only through the act of riding a worm that a Fremen truly enters manhood, and is another one of their rituals tied to their ecologically focused religion. Paul understands the necessity for this, and after his success says, And I am a Fremen born this day, here in the Habena Erg. I have had no life before this day. I was a child until this day. Paul's solution to his leadership crisis is finally to accept the full mantle of religious leader of the Fremen as well as reinstating his ducal right to rule Arrakis, leaving Stilgar in his secular role as leader of Siege Tabar. In keeping Stilgar alive, Paul makes a change to Fremen custom, bringing back elements of the rule of the Empire. In a sense we can also view this as a beginning of the death of the Fremen way of life on Arrakis, something that continues to degenerate throughout the course of the novels. Hence Paul's leadership will now start to change the Fremen, ultimately for the worse, when they will become museum Fremen, sad remnants of their former selves. The culmination of Paul's abilities comes with one final task before he confronts his enemies, the Harkonnen and the Emperor. He must consume the water of life and safely transmute the poisonous bile of the sand trout in order to fully recognise his potential as a Kwisatz Haderach. 
This is the last process of death and renewal, a descent into the underworld that is very nearly fatal. This descent is another common mytheme in the heroic tradition and is again symbolic of the death and rebirth of the hero. A hero must descend into the underworld, or hell, before emerging reborn to vanquish his enemies. This descent is mirrored in the litany against fear, as a little death that allows the hero to accomplish their task free of the fear of death and failure. The hero is only single minded of purpose from this point on, and to a certain degree has shed not just their fear, but to a certain extent some of their humanity as well. Paul ends up in a near death state for three weeks, looking within at the place where only the Kwisat Sadarak can go and where the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mothers cannot. The realization that Paul is the culmination of the Bene Gesserit breeding program is not lost upon Jessica, and it gives her very little comfort. Paul explains his role as the Kwisat Sadrach as follows. Paul said, There is in each of us an ancient force that takes and an ancient force that gives. A man finds little difficulty facing that place within himself where the taking force dwells, but it's almost impossible for him to see into the giving force without changing into something other than man. For a woman, the situation is reversed. Jessica looked up, found Chani was staring at her while listening to Paul. Do you understand me, mother? Paul asked. She could only nod. These things are so ancient within us, Paul said, that they're ground into each separate cell of our bodies, we're shaped by such forces. You can say to yourself, yes, I see how such a thing may be. But when you look inward and confront the raw force of your own life unshielded, you see your peril. You see that this could overwhelm you. The greatest peril to the giver is the force that takes. The greatest peril to the taker is the force that gives. It's as easy to be overwhelmed by giving as by taking. And you, my son, Jessica asked, are you one who gives or one who takes? I'm at the fulcrum, he said. I cannot give without taking, and I cannot take without... Paul is now fully transformed, at once a hero, prophet, messiah, and duke to the Fremen. He is finally ready to lead them against their oppressors and help bring about the realisation of their religious and ecological ambitions. With becoming the Kwisatz Haderach, a little more of his humanity is drained away even to the extent of failing to prevent the death of his son Leto. His prescience is not perfect however, and the sacrifices that Paul accepts are as far as he perceives his actions to be necessary for the greater good to prevent the jihad he sees coming. As he approaches the very anticlimactic conclusion to the action in June, Paul's prescience becomes more and more muddled. He is unable to foresee his son's death, or for that matter, to prevent it. His association with the heroic tradition, in that he is fundamentally related to death and destruction, becomes apparent to him. Everything he touches seems to now only bring death and grief. The narrative concludes with both Paul and Alia settling old scores and creating new alliances. Alia kills her grandfather, the Baron Harkonnen, whilst Paul slays Fade Rautha in one last final test before usurping Shaddam IV and placing himself on the throne. He has led the Fremen to freedom, defeated his adversaries, and become the most powerful man in the universe. In terms of a heroic narrative, he has been presented by Herbert as a successful hero, albeit flawed to a certain but apparently minor degree. He has fulfilled the first 13 of Lord Raglan's ritual steps that the hero must follow. Herbert began writing a sequel to Dune in 1968, originally intending to call the novel Full Saint, and then The Messiah. He eventually settled on the name Dune Messiah. Initially, because of the path followed and the nature of his hero, John W. Campbell, editor of the magazine Analog, which first published Dune in its serialised form, was far from happy with Herbert's treatment of the sequel. 
In The Road to June, some of the Frank Herbert John W. Campbell correspondence has been preserved. Campbell's initial response to Frank Herbert's first treatment of June Messiah is as follows. Paul commits acts of absolute folly, which you seek to explain on the basis of his vision requires it. Paul winds up as a god that failed. He winds up, in Fremen terms, which he accepts as useless to the tribe cripple abandoned in the desert. In outline, it sounds like an epic tragedy, but when you start looking back on it, it works out to Paul was a damn fool and surely no demigod. He loused up himself, his loved ones and the whole galaxy. Herbert immediately began work on a new treatment of June Messiah which was forwarded to his agent who received it with a positive outlook. The new treatment was sent to John W. Campbell who again reacted to the new text unfavourably. Herbert's vision of the Messiah still didn't satisfy me. In this one, it's Paul, our central character, who is a helpless pawn manipulated against his will by a cruel destructive fate. The reactions of science fictioneers, however, over the last few decades have persistently and quite explicitly been that they want heroes, not anti-heroes. They want stories of strong men who exert themselves, inspire others, and make a monkey's uncle out of malign fates. Campbell's response is highly indicative of the stagnation that riddled the American pulp science fiction publishers at the time. It showed little insight into Herbert's intent to present a hero whose abilities were fundamentally though not intentionally destructive to society and whose mystique led to utter obedience and infatuation amongst his people. In fact, anti-heroes were becoming popular from this time on, and Campbell who saw himself as a father to several supermen was oblivious to this. The comments he presented in the above correspondence show his interest in the Ubermensch type hero that had indeed been popular for some time, especially in the works of authors such as A. E. Van Vogt. But that trend had begun in the late 30s and early 40s, and science fiction had almost passed through the 60s and into the 70s, a time of great change within the genre. June had been hailed as a great success, it had developed a reputation as a famous underground novel, its sales were increasing steadily day by day and had acquired several accolades, including the Hugo and Nebula Awards. In spite of this, John W. Campbell ultimately refused to publish June Messiah, being unable to consolidate himself with what was inherently a hero in direct opposition to the stagnating Superman of the golden age of science fiction that he was churning out. In June Messiah, Herbert created a classic inversion of themes that demonstrated his success at attacking the science fiction hero. So much so, that June Messiah was not published until eventually Galaxy Magazine accepted the story and ran it in a total of five instalments between July and November in 1969. It was simply not what John W. Campbell wanted, but it was what science fiction readers liked. While in June we are subtly misled into following the hero Paul, in June Messiah we are shocked from the very beginning to discover the wholesale death and destruction that his theocratic imperialism has brought to the universe in only 12 years. Paul is still very much the protagonist of the story, but as a hero the consequences of his actions are uncomfortable at the very least to the reader. As the Emperor Muad'Dib, Paul dominates the universe by his control of the oracular geriatric spice Melange. All of the major political players rely on Melange, the guild navigators rely on it for space travel, the Bene Gesserit's reverend mothers use it to see within themselves and use the other memory of the female genetic line, and Melange's properties as a geriatric drug mean that many who have depended upon it to extend their natural lifespan die from withdrawal of the drug. Jun Messiah moves away from the heroic adventure of Jun and is a much more politically charged novel. Although there are still elements of action and adventure, a great deal of what occurs within the novel focuses on a Machiavellian conspiracy to wrest power away from Paul. In moving away from the form of the epic heroic adventure, 
Dune Messiah as a much smaller work than Dune focuses much more directly on the tragic elements of its epic hero. It is also very much a bridging novel between Dune and Children of Dune, Herbert having always conceived the work as being in three key parts. Dune Messiah begins with a recap prologue, followed by a first chapter that presents a historical analysis of Bronzo of Ix, which in similarity to Dune, lets the reader into some of what lies ahead. Paul rules the universe as Emperor, while having placed his sister Alia on a religious throne, leading the faith of the Quisarati, who worship Muad'Dib. Paul and his family are plotted against by a group of conspirators made up of the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen of Mohim, a Bene Tylax by the name of Skytail, a guild stairsman called Edric, and Paul's wife, Irulan. The aim of their plot is complex. First, they attempt to muddy Paul's oracular vision to hide their intentions. They do this with the help of Edric, whose abilities as a guild steersman offer him a degree of the same prescient power that Paul possesses. To a certain extent, this is also done by the introduction of the Dune Tarot, which from the Bene Gesserit point of view also helps muddy Paul's prescience. They also intend to prevent Paul's concubine Chani from conceiving a child by administrating a contraceptive poison in her food and drink. This is because ultimately Irulan wants to father a child by Paul and have her own heir to his empire ruled formerly by her father. The guild and the Bene Gesserit have the need to regain a certain control over the Spice Melange, upon which both of whom heavily rely. The other part of their plan is therefore to attempt to capture a worm of Arrakis and take it off world, in the hope of breaking the Spice Monopoly. As for Skytail, who is a face dancer, able to assume the shape and personality of any given individual, his intent is to present Paul with a very unusual gift, namely a gola of his deceased mentor Duncan Idaho, that goes by the name of Hate. Ultimately the Bene Chilax hope to control Paul by having his wife killed, and understanding that once dead she can be cloned and have her personality restored as a gola, he will succumb to his grief and ask for this unthinkable boon. Where Dune Messiah differs significantly from its handling of its heroic and messianic themes is in the systems of power that develop around Paul and those individuals who control them. The conspiracy against Paul is one such group, while the religious Quisarati who follow the religion of Moadib is another. The Fremen, and in particular the Naibs and Jihadists, are another group struggling to come to terms with their place in a very different universe from the one they knew some twelve years before. Finally, the barometer for these changes is surely Paul's friend, former leader, teacher, and companion, the Fremen Stilgar, who has become the Minister of State. Stilgar is at once part of the administration of Paul's government, but at the same time deeply resentful of the hateful pomp which surrounds Moadib's throne. Reiterating Herbert's concept that even with a fantastically powerful and charismatic figurehead, eventually fallible mortals take over the power structure that always comes into being around such a leader, we find the true theme in Dune Messiah. The power structures that are attempting to develop around Paul Atreides are desired by those slavish people who have given all their critical faculties over to their living god. The followers that develop the corresponding systems of power and control around their heroes, ultimately destroying them, make up the second part of Herbert's concept of the messianic impulse and why heroes are so dangerous to society. Paul's only real desire is to renounce the religion that has developed around him, and to live a happy peaceful life with his beloved Chani, but the future haunts him, knowing that people will use his name, or his sisters, to carry on the religion. Ultimately he does not give in to his desires, as he knows that if he does not attempt to follow the golden path, humanity's extinction lies at the end of it. As Farrakh, just before he is murdered by Skytail, notes, the apparatus of government accompanies him everywhere, clerks and attendants and attendants for the attendants. 
Paul's religion itself has grown into, as Skytail observes, myth all tangled up with facts, as well as a lumbering bureaucracy. The most obvious example of this slavish obedience combined with a desire to take over the religious bureaucracy in Jum Messiah is Korba the Quizara, the former Feda king who has now become a priest. Both Paul and Alia are fully disapproving of Korba and the activities of his Quizarati, who are viewed as spies by the people. Korba is a fanatic who greatly enjoys the religious power that he possesses as part of Paul's administration, but Paul himself views the former death commando with amusement, asking himself, what is more ridiculous than a death commando transformed into a priest? As various groups bolster their influence to attempt to limit Paul's imperial government, it is Korba who suggests that a religious constitution be created. It is the religious mystique that surrounds the Atreides family that is in part a tool of their statecraft, albeit an essentially deceitful one. This mystique in turn creates most of the slavish obedience that the majority of Paul's citizens, especially the Fremen, hold for them. Stilgar alone is able to grasp to a certain extent that his friends Paul and Alia are not gods, though the sense of mystique is still great within him. In that light, both Paul and Alia try to a certain extent to educate Stilgar about their unusual abilities, though not always with success. Stilgar is nonetheless insightful and intelligent, understanding that his queen witch and sorcerer friend betrayed dangerous weaknesses. After a visit from the guild steersman Edric and Skytail, Paul continues to attempt to educate Stilgar in the long term effects of his rule. He does this by presenting some fragments of history from before the Butlerian Jihad, what are essentially to Stilgar, myths of Old Earth. Paul presents in particular two examples of Old Earth emperors, namely Genghis Khan and Adolf Hitler. The atrocities of Genghis Khan and Hitler are presented to Stilgar merely as statistics relating to the number of people they killed. Stilgar is at first impressed, thinking that these individuals killed their victims personally, but Paul's lesson to Stilgar is that both individuals killed the same way he does, through their legions. 4 million killed by Genghis Khan and 6 million by Hitler leave Stilgar ultimately unimpressed, compared to the destructive power of Muad'Dib. Not very impressive statistics, my lord. Very good still. Paul glanced at the reels in Korba's hands. Korba stood with them as though he wished he could drop them and flee. Statistics. At a conservative estimate, I've killed 61 billion, sterilised 90 planets, completely demoralised 500 other, I've wiped out the followers of 40 religions which had existed since. Unbelievers, Korba protested. Unbelievers all! No, Paul said. Believers. Korba firmly believes that Muad'Dib's religion has brought the people of a thousand worlds into the light and glory of the Emperor. But Paul understands the opposite. He has brought death and destruction to a vast number of people and worlds and firmly believes that mankind will be a long time recovering from the effects of his rule. Still he does this out of the necessity of the golden path, only through which can humanity survive. Korba's comments illustrate to both the reader and to Paul exactly who does control the universe and his power base. The exchange in this chapter highlights that Stilgar has yet to fall into slavish obedience to Paul while at the same time showing how slavish and unthinking Korba has become. Paul's intent in providing these educational moments to Stilgar is to ensure he has a friend who still remains loyal to him and his family, yet at the same time has retained his own faculties and judgement. The legions control, Paul said. I wonder if they know this. You control your legions, sire, Stilgar interrupted and it was obvious from the tone of his voice that he suddenly felt his own position in that chain of command, his own hand guiding all that power. Korba, however, is beyond redemption. 
His thinking has been given over completely to the religion of Moadib, and he relishes his power in the Quisarati. Most importantly, he has forgotten he is a Fremen. The problem for Paul and his sister lies in the nature of their rule, and how their power base is focused on not just Paul's oracular vision, but also the religious mystique and fervour that have grown around them. The mystique has become a necessity of their rule, and to a large degree they must pander to it in order to rule. This facet of their rule is nonetheless a product of the Bene Gesserit's Missionaria Protectiva, manipulated by them and their mother over the years to enable them to survive and be accepted by the Fremen. Paul's visions, boosted by his use of the oracular spice melange and draped in Zen Sunni mystery, continue to trouble him. He is plagued by images of a missing moon, symbolic of the destruction his government and religion have brought to the Fremen's way of life. But the moon is also symbolic of his love for Chani, his concubine, and the missing moon also represents the death of Chani, as those who seek to control some part of his rule target her. The Gola hate, trained in both Zen Sunni philosophy and as a mentat, attempts to interpret Paul's vision, telling him he is drunk on too much time. The mystery of Paul's visions, as he explains it using mentat logic, is that Paul runs from death and the fear of the power his vision grants. The Gola realises that Paul's empire must live its time and die, like all others throughout history. Ever increasing to Paul at this point is his terrible purpose, and the desire to evade it and spend a simple life with Chani. Paul therefore attempts to bargain with the Bene Gesserit for the life of Chani, offering his seed and the artificial insemination of Irla. This will allow the Bene Gesserit to continue their breeding program, but at the same time preventing any child of Irla becoming his heir. Despite being poisoned with a contraceptive, Chani has managed to conceive a child of Paul's and is now pregnant with, unknown to Paul, the twins Leto and Ganima. The conspiracy against Paul feels the need to move against him quicker now, as Paul's oracular vision has revealed they intend to strike at him through Chani. They are aware that Paul's government is most unusual and has left its mark across the whole universe. To topple it will have dire, far flung, and unforeseen consequences. Skytail, the main threat to Paul from the conspiracy, is as ever shrewd when he describes the characteristics of Paul's government, once again highlighting Herbert's idea of the nature of power and the satellites that develop around it. It is not just a religion, Skytail said, wondering what the Reverend Mother would say to this harsh education of their fellow conspirator. Religious government is something else. Moadib has crowded his quizarate in everywhere, displaced the old functions of government. But he has bishop pricks, islands of authority. At the centre of each island is a man. Men learn how to gain and hold personal power. Men are jealous. The conspiracy decides to move against Paul with the hate Gola, whom they believe is still under their control. However, the hate Gola is regaining more and more of his memories every day, becoming more and more Duncan Idaho. Paul also now knows that Chani will die in childbirth, and that to a certain extent, the poisonous contraceptive that Irlan has been feeding her has extended her life. But now that she is pregnant, and forced to go on a Fremen diet, eating and drinking the spice, her pregnancy is being accelerated, and her metabolism along with it. The trap for Paul is sprung, and he is enticed to honour a water debt to an old Fremen and former Feda king, Othim. The trap is set by the face dancer Skytail, in the disguise of Othim's daughter, who informs him that there is a plot against him amongst the Fremen. Paul is aware of the trap but goes anyway, dressed as a Fremen. As he travels to see Othim, he observes the nature of his Quisarate in the streets of Arakin. He views the Quisarate not so much as a faith but as a bureaucracy of religious civil servants. 
Paul is also able to witness his sister Alia preaching to a group of pilgrims, and although he has seen her do this many times, he has never been in the crowd to witness its effect on the faithful. Paul arrives at Othim's home to find the former Feda king near death, with a spitting disease acquired during the jihadist wars. Othim warns Paul of a plot against him by the Fremen, and gives him as a gift a dwarf called Bijaz, who has been trained as a human distrans created by the Tleilaxu. A distrans is like a living memory recorder, and the dwarf contains within him the names of all the conspirators against Paul amongst the Fremen. The dwarf is part of the plot against Paul by the Tleilaxu, designed to activate the hate gola against Paul at a given time. Bijaz is obviously nervous and claims to possess a now sense, urging Paul to leave immediately, aware as he is of the impending attack. The attack that follows is by an atomic stone burner, a weapon banned by the Great Convention and which results in the blindness of Paul and many of his men. After the attack, Paul orders that any of his men who wish it may have their sight returned by artificial Tleilaxu manufactured eyes, though he himself does not take the devices. The Fremen traditionally leave their blind to die in the desert, but Paul is still able to see using his prescient vision, something which adds to the mystique and awe which his people hold for him. The Quisarate Corba is arrested and brought before judgment. In addition to having the stone burner brought to Arrakis, he's also helped to have a worm taken off planet with the aid of his Fremen co-conspirators. Corba's defence for his actions amounts to having done everything in the name of the Quisarate and obedience to Paul. His interrogation is designed to root out the other Fremen who are also conspiring against Paul. The conclusion to the events comes with the death of Chani giving birth to the twins of Moadib in her old home, Sich Tabar. Idaho's original personality is awakened by the dwarf Bijaz, and the Tleilaxu trap against Paul is finally sprung. Threatening to kill the newborn children, Skytail offers Paul to have his dead wife returned to him as a Gola, now sure that a person's memories and personality can be returned, and having Duncan Idaho as proof. Paul is able to briefly connect through his son's eyes and is able to kill the Tleilaxu before succumbing to his offer. The dwarf Bijaz however continues to present the offer and Duncan kills him at Paul's request. The story ends with Paul walking into the desert, as is traditional with the blind Fremen, to become ultimately more of a myth than a man. Apart from Irulan, the remaining members of the conspiracy despite Paul's orders to the contrary, are executed by Stilgar, and the government passes into the hands of Alia as regent. June Messiah ends on the philosophical musings of Duncan Idaho, who feels he might be best suited to understanding Paul and the nature of Atreides' rule. Judgment strategy, the Atreides called it in their training manuals. People are subordinate to government, but the ruled influence the rulers. Paul can be viewed in a number of aspects as the archetypal hero, and later as anti-hero, but can also be seen as the hero who is religious icon, prophet, and later divinity. Frank Herbert's view of the messianic impulses presented through the first Dune trilogy is essentially a comment on hero worship. Carlyle in his biographically focused study of the hero and hero worship, considered that within the roots of paganism, Hero worship would be the grand modifying element in that ancient system of thought. In examining the hero as divinity, he states that worship of a hero is transcendent admiration of a great man, and that hero worship endures forever while man endures. Carlyle points out here that worship of the hero as a divinity is perhaps the earliest form of hero worship in early and primitive societies, and in this case, uses Odin as his example. He suggests that Christianity may be the highest instance of hero worship where the hero is seen as a divinity, and echoing Herbert's view of the messianic impulse which periodically overtakes man, suggests the masses love, venerate and bow down submissive before great men, 
Nay, can we honestly bow down to anything else? Paul is not seen as divine by the Fremen until his supposed mysterious death, after which point, blind in the desert, he is seen as going through an apotheosis and raised to the point of divinity by the religion of Moadib. His return as the blind preacher and denouncement of his own religion will, however, relegate him back post mortem to the position of prophet who prepares the way for Leto II. His subsequent murder then brings to mind the way Carlyle discusses that as times change, so too do mankind's attitudes to the hero. Paul's actual death as opposed to his imagined death changes the view of his worship by the masses, where he as the hero is no longer seen as divine, but as one God inspired as a prophet, and hence is actually seen as a mortal. Relegated to the role of prophet, the population of the Imperium's society will now come to view him as an inspired human, who as father to Leto II will have paved the way for the truly divine being, the God Emperor. In recognising his failure in the Golden Path, Paul ultimately accepts his son's new role in continuing it, describing him as the healer. In telling Gurney Halleck how he once opposed Leto II's action, he tells his former teacher to look at this Atreides youth. He is the ultimate feedback upon which our species depends. He'll reinsert into the system the results of its past performance. In describing his own passing, Paul describes his failure in carrying out the Golden Path in the following terms. Paul Atreides is no more. He tried to stand as a supreme moral symbol while he renounced all moral pretensions. He became a saint without a god, every word a blasphemy. With the passing of Paul a new religion will arise, that of the god emperor, the divinity of the son relegating his father to saint and prophet. His religion is more terrifying, far reaching and damaging to humanity than even his father's which resulted in the death of billions. At one point Leto II tells Paul, your jihad will be a summer picnic on Caladan by comparison. Herbert is not just implicit of the dangers of heroes to society. In Children of Dune, he sets the stage for the ultimate tyrant and the all-pervasive religion that builds around him. For Herbert, after hammering home his lesson, he reiterates it again, showing the reader that, yes indeed, it could be worse. It is a new cult to be wary of. Caution is indeed indicated, but not the terror that prevents all movement. Hang loose, and when someone asks whether you're starting a new cult, do what I do. Run like hell.